glimpse of the Navy of tomorrow, the USS Boston, America's first guided missile cruiser in action off Cuba. From below deck magazines, its potent Terrier missiles are automatically positioned on launching racks. Ship and missile were designed for each other in what engineers call an integrated weapon system, lethally efficient. This cruiser mounts no big guns. One of its missiles can sink any enemy ship or with an atom warhead, smash an enemy base. A full salvo can be aimed and fired in seconds, guided to target while in flight. With the advent of the USS Boston class, the guided missile comes into its own at sea. A new combat punch of the surface Navy. This is Hudsonville, Michigan, after the tornado. Hudsonville, worst hit by a two-day series of storms that struck with unpredictable fury across 14 states in the nation's midsection. 13 were killed in Hudsonville, 17 all told in Michigan, 8 in Wisconsin, 5 in Oklahoma, 4 in Tennessee. Total, 43. A massive cold front moving eastward triggered the treacherous twisters, killer winds that come with the spring. These were the worst in 36 years. The cold front also stirred up the worst dust storms within memory in West Texas and a crippling blizzard in the Dakotas. But the tornadoes were the worst. Ask the living in Hudsonville. They escaped with their lives, but not much else. Spring is a time of new life, but where a spring tornado strikes, death walks the land. Is this a creature from outer space trying its land legs on planet Earth? No, it's a robot weather station being tested at the Naval Research Laboratory for use in the Antarctic. It's nicknamed Grasshopper. Ingeniously, it stands up, raises its own antenna and other devices for weather recording. Plans how to drop it by parachute onto the polar ice cap. Once in operation, the battery-powered robot transmits via radio vital data on wind speeds, temperature, pressure, and other weather information. Its signals can be heard 800 miles away. The data transmitted is received in code on a tape recorder. If a thing like this makes the weatherman obsolete, we'll be blaming bad weather on a grasshopper. Or is that cricket? Ten horses of the United States Olympic jumping team are loaded aboard a transatlantic plane for their trip to Stockholm, where they will compete in June. Representing the United States are four riders, Frank Chapote, William Steinkraus, the captain, Hugh Wiley, and Warren Warford. Besides competing in the Stockholm Olympic events, the Grand Prix team will also be entered in subsequent meets in Copenhagen, Aachen, Germany, London, and Dublin before returning home. The valuable steeds are carefully secured in their stalls for the 15-hour flight. Many laurels to their credit, the flying horses and equestrians have high hopes of bringing an Olympic first home with them. Film star Grace Kelly, surrounded by a milling crowd, arrives to board the SS Constitution for her trip to Monaco and her marriage to Prince Ranier. Bedlam awaits her at the shipboard press conference. I hope for a large family, says Grace. There'll be none of the wedding party. Oh, no, none at all. Miss Kelly, members of the crew of the yacht, you know, I have never... I can't get a word in edgewise. Bon voyage, Grace. America wishes you happiness. Doubly burdened by parachutes and bulky parkas, 700 paratroopers board their planes at Thule Air Force Base, Greenland, for exercise Arctic night. It's a long way from home for the 82nd Airborne, winding up two weeks of sub-zero training and indoctrination with the first airborne operation north of the Arctic Circle. The Joint Air Force and Army maneuver brings to the highest peak modern tactics for combat at the top of the world. Something new for this frosty wasteland where mere survival has always been a full-time job and warfare unknown. But war today is no respecter of geography. The mock battleground is a frozen fjord, a layer of ice 55 inches thick. Sounds cold, looks cold, it is cold. Here's how to keep warm when they stop moving. Dig snow shelters, simple and effective. 
the outcome of exercise Arctic night, victory for the airborne over the world's least livable terrain and climate. The Greatest Show on Earth opens its 1956 season at Madison Square Garden with traditional gaiety and glitter and the breathtaking artistry of lovely Pinita Del Oro, featured in the aerial ballet Mexicanorama. Appearing for the first time in America is the balancing wizard Titos. He uses his head and manages to get along nicely. Japan's Takeo Yusui scales the slack wire to the very apex of the big top. The climax, a death-defying slide for life, a highlight of the show. A new year and a new Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus carrying on in the grand old tradition. Navy Yard, the new Queen of the Fleet is commissioned with top brass from the Secretary of the Navy on down, present for the notable occasion. Captain Robert Stroh takes command of the 60,000 ton carrier USS Saratoga, the biggest and most powerful vessel afloat. Special attention was given crewman's comfort in her design, which also provided unmatched plane handling facilities, key to her striking power. The new Saratoga, sixth Navy vessel to bear the name, would dwarf her World War II namesake with its giant flight deck, five city blocks long, one block wide, and its complement of 100 jets and crew of 3,500. The greatest one-ship concentration of naval power ever built. Truly the new Queen of the Seas. Prince Renier's yacht bears his betrothed in triumph into the harbor at Monaco. A few hours earlier, Grace Kelly of Philadelphia and Hollywood stepped aboard the Deo Giovanti from the liner Constitution, which carried her across the Atlantic. A picture queen who will become a princess greets her new subjects and is greeted by them in turn as she goes ashore to a tumultuous welcome. The little postcard principality wears its heart on its sleeve, its feelings expressed by two small monogasques offering flowers. From far or near, all eyes are on this old world city and its bachelor prince, who wooed and won him a leap year bride in the new world. Through streets decked with American and Monacan flags, he whisks her off to his pink and white castle on the eve of the wedding of the year. Famed Mount Etna, snow-covered, and during recorded history, one of the landmarks of the Mediterranean comes alive again as guides from a safe distance watch the awesome spectacle of its eruption. Dormant for many years, it shoots streams of lava hundreds of feet into the air. There is reason for the apprehension, for in ages past, Etna has brought terror, death, and destruction in previous eruptions. But here, a howling blizzard also threatens a photographic party seeking to film the interior of one of the craters. Flames and ice, the eternal riddle of Mount Etna, tempestuous sentinel of the Mediterranean. An 80-year-old landmark in Vienna goes up in smoke as fire of undetermined origin consumes the ancient stock exchange. Built in 1877, it was one of the scenes of many famous European financial transactions until the Nazi invasion, and one of the finer examples of Viennese architecture. All through the night, the fire rages out of control, consuming the beautiful colonnades for which it was noted. After the coming of peace to Austria, the building was used as a merchandise market. Doomed to be demolished, the ancient building, scene of much 19th century history, leaves a void in Vienna's colorful downtown district. First look at the Starfighter, newest member of the Air Force's Century Series of Advanced Supersonic Combat Planes. This is the F-104, powered by a new and more powerful jet engine. 
the Lance-like craft has other new features. Among them, the first downward ejection seat system for a production jet fighter. It flies on thin, straight, razor-sharp wings, this so-called aeronautical bolt of lightning whose operational altitude is the stratosphere. Described as the most advanced plane of its type, the Lockheed Starfighter goes through its paces. Defense Department films record the premiere of a new star blazing in the sky. At San Francisco State College, an all-out campus blood drive brings the gift of life to one student, Jim Garner, who, despite his need of a daily transfusion, has married, has a healthy, sturdy son, and is earning a college degree in social welfare. His fellow students have already given 500 pints of blood to keep in check the rare form of hemophilia that requires a pint of fresh globulin daily to prevent agonizing, eventually fatal bleeding. This day is the supreme effort, San Francisco State's graduation gift to Jim Garner, 200 days of life. Jim's problems aren't solved for good, but it's a great assist to bolster the rare qualities of courage and good cheer that have carried him this far and won so many friends. The Pan American Union pays tribute to the late Cordell Hull, Isabel and Marcella Delgado, daughters of the chairman of the Council of the Organization of American States, unveil a bust of the Nobel Prize winning Secretary of State, the architect of the good neighbor policy. Milton Eisenhower speaks as personal representative of the president. The Western Hemisphere honors a man whose achievements transcended the politics of his time. Eight thousand fans in Tokyo's Metropolitan Gym see a thrilling wind-up of ten days of table tennis. In the mixed doubles, an American team on the far side pulls the big surprise of the world's championship. Point for the Americans. Their opponents are top-seeded Ivan Andriadis of Czechoslovakia and Anne Hayden of England. That's mixed doubles indeed. Seventeen-year-old Erwin Klein of Los Angeles and Mrs. Leah Neuberger of New York are the only Americans to win a cup during the ten-day tournament. Set and match point coming up. When the British gals return misses the table, it's all over about the shouting and the hugging. In Tokyo, New York loves Los Angeles. They coast to coast it to victory.